Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. I am thrilled to introduce our panelists and moderator today as they discuss keeping the ball rolling, the evolution, uh, the evolving fight for DE and in sports. My name is Riley Foreman, and I am a second year MBA student here at Sloan. Our moderator today will be Candace Sotman, Senior Director of Strategy at Laundry Service. Allison Feaster, VP of Player Development and Organizational Growth for the Boston Celtics. We're also joined by Kat Frederick, Chief Marketing Officer of the Los Angeles Rams, as well as Broderick Hicks, VP of Brands at Wasserman, and special thank you to Wasserman for sponsoring this panel. Um, and we also have Nicole Jeter West, CEO, Underdog Venture Team. This panel will last 45 minutes with an additional 10 minutes at the end saved for audience Q&A. Please submit any questions to Twitter using the hashtag SportsDE&I. And with that, I'll turn it over to Candace. All right, well, hello, everyone. This light is beaming. It's very bright. So it's very bright. Oh bear with me. I wish I could see you. <laughs> but I, I can't see it anything. So I'm going to stick to my little script here because I have a tendency to, to go off of it quite often. <clears throat> um, so you'll see me like looking down. But um, as, as Riley mentioned, I'm Candace Saltman, uh, Senior Director of Strategy at Laundry Service, so part of Wasserman Media Group. And I'm going to be your moderator today. And uh, our uh, panel discussion is titled Keeping the Ball Rolling, the Evolving Fight for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Sports. Um, before we start, I do want to preface that DE&I is not just a movement, but a professional trade. And although these panelists aren't personal experts in DE&I, their contributions and their experiences are valid and their input in this discussion is incredibly valuable. So this is an always relevant topic as we know. Um, it's attracted and induced lots of debates and uh, has brought to the forefront some really strong voices um, and the need for it now has been felt across all industries, so not just sports. Um, from, you know, Brian Flores and the Rooney Rule to the Tesla discrimination lawsuit and the recent appointment of Katanji Brown-Jackson, you know, issues of DE&I are not an isolated issue. Um, so with today's panel, uh, we're hoping that through this conversation we're able to humanize the subject uh, with our panelists' personal stories and experiences. So all that to say, we got some real heavy hitters in this room, and I'm sure that's why a lot of you guys have pulled up today. Uh, these are seasoned professionals um, and, and experts in their craft, and they really could speak to any number of issues on any stage, but they're here with us today. Um, so I do want to introduce them once again. I'm gonna start here with Kat Frederick, Chief Marketing Officer of the Los Angeles Rams, and as we all know, the Super Bowl champions. Yeah. <laughs> this is also Kat's eighth season here at Sloan, so we got a vet with us. Uh, Broderick Hicks, Vice President of Brands at Wasserman, also 40 Under 40 alumni. Ooh. And he doesn't like to talk about it too much, but he is a retired pro ball player and NCAA <laughs> athlete. Nicole Jetter West, CEO uh, of Underdog Venture West, a social impact organization focused on DE&I and across sports, media, and lifestyle tech, and head of marketing and brand engagement for LA28, which is going to be major, you know, the Los Angeles Organizing uh, Committee for the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And Allison Feaster, uh, Vice President for Player Development and Organizational Growth for the Boston Celtics and co-leader of Celtics United Social, Social uh, Justice Initiative, retired WNBA pro ball player for Los Angeles Sparks, Charlotte Sting, and Indiana Fever, and retired NCAA athlete coming from Harvard. So uh, I am super humbled to be up here with these guys. All right, guys, well, we have a really great conversation for you, um, so just gonna get right into it. Yesterday, a lot of us attended the, the Multiplier Summit, and something that really stood out to me was this importance and impact that having advocates and, and mentors can have on your career. You know, establishing relationships and role models and having sponsors is essential, uh, you know, especially for minorities, you know, in sports. Coming into this industry, you know, that has for so long excluded them, there can sometimes be this, like, implicit sense that I don't belong here. 
Um, so just to kick us off, you know, I, I think a lot of us feel like in order for us to move up the ladder, we didn't get there alone. So Allison, I'm actually gonna start with you uh, to kick us off and share how important it is to have folks that invest in you mm -hmm. and also how that supported you and shaped you in your career growth. Super, um, super important to have uh, people pour into you. Obviously, uh, no one gets where he or she is alone. I wanna give a shout out directly to Jess Gelman, one of the co-founders of this, this conference um, and former Harvard teammate of mine. Obviously, I have you know, my breath and body of work um, you know, that supports my presence here, but it certainly helps when people who have power and influence can, you know, make a decision and very deliberate decision to have diverse voices. So I want to shout her out for always including different voices in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I can look back to my time early on at the NBA League office as a younger professional, obviously later in my life, but young in terms of professional years. Um, the, the women, specifically the women of color in that, in, in that space, wrapped their arms around me and um, led me along uh, to, to where I am today. I, the current uh, head of league operations at the WNBA, there's a vice president in NBA basketball operations, um, and I can name countless others who uh, took their own personal time to wrap their arms around younger professionals, specifically the ones of color who traditionally are underrepresented in front offices and you know, in positions of, of influence and power in, in, in a lot of spaces in professional sports. So a very, very, very important um, role that those in leadership play, but it's also incumbent upon you know, us as younger professionals in the space to uh, make yourself available, um, ask for help, reach out, and, and you know, go from there. So super important to have that sponsorship. Absolutely. Nicole, you've spoken on this as well, you know, the importance of having your value recognized and in receiving validation. Can you tell us more about that too and the importance of it for you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for us to anyone, right? Regardless of your, your race, your background, that you walk into a room and you understand what your value is mm -hmm. and you understand the value that you can bring. And that value is part of the experience that you have. So bring your personal experience, bring your professional experience, bring your background, bring your culture, bring all that to the table. Um, because what I found is when that happens, the room is better. Mm -hmm. um, I think Kathy, Kathy Carter, who I most recently worked with at LA 28, um, and hopefully she doesn't mind me sharing publicly, she would always say, we're better with you in the room. Mm. And that's, I take that because I thought, I always bring me to the room. It doesn't change with whoever's in the room. I just bring me. And me is a, you know, a girl who grew up who's black and Puerto Rican, who you know, parents didn't go to college, who I was the first to have a lot of experiences. And going into this world of sport and working for the New York Knicks and USTA and all of these brands and having these experiences, I brought all of that with me. So I didn't try to downplay any of that or change any of that when I was in the room. And I think having that understanding of I can be who I am and I can bring that to the table and that's actually going to add value. What I think's happening now is everyone else is waking up to that. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't necessarily as welcomed in all the rooms, but I've been really fortunate and blessed to have great advocates. Um, most of my advocates are white males. Mm -hmm. I could list them off, but most of my advocates are white males. And those were the people who would call me and go, hey, this great opportunity is happening, and I think you'd be great. Or, hey, I dropped your name over here, expect a call. And so because of that, the doors were open. Now, did I have to be ready? Did I have to know my stuff? Did I have to be prepared, like experience all of that? Yes. So opening the door is only part of it, but it is necessary for somebody to help open the door. And so if you're in a position of power and a position of um, decision making, open the door. Mm -hmm. And like, that is how you get innovation. Yeah, I think a, a big takeaway I had yesterday too is that those role models don't always have to look like you to advocate for you. Um, so, you know, but I do think it's still important, right, that we're, we're casting right folks, you know, in, in leadership roles, people of color in those roles, you know, um, 
and that really can set the tone and, and make it be good or bad for business depending on who are on those fronts. So Braja, can you speak towards the importance of like intentional diversity, you know, especially at that leadership level in like decision making positions? Yeah, and honestly, it's not that hard. We just, if you put people of color, different genders in leadership positions, you will start to see the trickle down effects. Um, there were very few of us in our team at Wasserman when I first started. There is a lot more of us now, and I think there's no, uh, the correlation between that increase, I think is, um, directly tied to some of us being eventually given opportunities to hire people. I'm proud of the, uh, the diverse makeup of our account team, which I have an opportunity to hire, but that's not all me, it's hiring a diverse team, but then also giving them the opportunity to then hire, which turns into more diversity on through. So, um, I know it takes a village for all of us to get here, but really it takes one person to give you an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate to get that opportunity and I feel so responsible to pass down that opportunity, um, mostly just to make sure that we have a team that reflects the market that we're trying to market to. Um, so everyone doesn't have to look the same, be the same. Diversity is not just color or gender, it's also diversity of background, diversity of thought, diversity of level, um, because that's where we, at least we, in the work that we do, get the best work. Mm -hmm. Beat it up. So true. You, yep. you provide ideas, you beat it up, you share blind spots that other people just may not know. I've learned so much. Our group is led by some amazing people, but also some amazing women. And they have um, Liz Lindsay from Denise Durante before her, Malcolm Turner. Like we've had diverse leaders, and I've learned from all of them um, and helped close some blind spots that I've had on my own. To, and uh, that benefit is. Um, that benefit has been invaluable to me, but I also feel the responsibility then to pay it on, but it's not even that hard to do. It's like, I mean, I didn't plan it this way. We actually just hired two black guys to, that are gonna start on our team this week. Um, and it wasn't that hard to find them, mm -hmm. and it wasn't that hard to hire them. So it's like, it, it's not this ethereal thing that like diversity is hard to touch and reach. It's like, it's, we're just, we're, all of us are sitting right here. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I just don't, I want us to get lost in the complexity of what that means. It just means like reaching out to the person next to you and just build a diverse team, give them an opportunity, see what happens. Um, and I think, the, at least for me, the benefits have been far outweighed the effort. He mentioned, some, he mentioned Malcolm Turner. Um, he was mm -hmm. at the NBA when I first started, mm -hmm. but another um, you know, person, a leader who wrapped his arms around, you know, a younger professional to, to, to guide. So just want to call that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've Sorry. I've heard a lot answer. about, no, all good. <laughs> I would love for you guys to just vibe out with one another. I've heard a lot about Malcolm. Through yeah. So. Kat, uh, could you speak to that as well? Like the, the importance of intentional diversity? I mean, I think when you think about the roles that all of us have and, and how you do your job, mm -hmm. doing my job at the LA Rams means building a team that is reflective, as Broderick said, of the market. That means that we need people of Latinx background. We need people of African-American background. We need people that represent the non-monolithic audience that is LA, and as you go out from there, the globe. Mm -hmm. And so how can you have that diversity of thought, perspective, experience, if you all look and, be, and, and think the same. And the way that I look at it is it's like a, it's, it's like the pieces in the puzzle box. They all have to fit, they all have to complement each other. You all have to have a singular objective. But at the end of the day, the richness of that diversity that you can bring to the conversation, especially with lean and mean teams like we have at the Rams, you can do so much more when you start with such diverse ingredients. Mm -hmm. And that way you can challenge each other to say that's not authentic. And it, and it all comes down to what is the benefit, right? When we think about diversity, it's not, diversity is not an end game. Mm -hmm. Diversity is a means to bring that richness mm -hmm. of thought and conversation 
to the economic benefit of your company. We are still a for-profit organization, but how you get there is, is part of that joy in the journey. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, for us, being able to authentically engage across LA, whether that means down to San Diego, up to Santa Barbara, Inland Empire, Watts, Inglewood, Crenshaw, that requires the ability to say, is that an authentic engagement? And how can you do that if you're sitting outside of those experiences or those cultures? Um, and so it's not a nice to have. Mm -hmm. It's a need to have. Uh, and that's certainly how we approach it. Yeah. Innovation, is, innovation comes from having diverse perspectives. And so there's so many companies and organizations, and I've been part of them, that will be like, we need to figure out how to be innovative. We should get a group to come in and show us how to be innovative. And you should not have to do that. Right. Innovation comes by you having diverse thought and talent and experiences at the table. And if you sit in a room, in your boardroom or in your meetings, and you look around and everyone looks the same, you gotta ask yourself the question like, is this, is this where we're going? Because our country doesn't look the same. The, major, the minority is now the majority, right? Like if you're not reflective of what the consumer is, then you really need to ask yourself like, is our organization best suited and built to be able to innovate and take on whatever the next thing is going to be? Because you don't have that reflected inside your organization. And I think that's... How do you force yourself out of the echo chamber? <clears throat> Absolutely. Because it'll repeat itself if you don't broaden the thinking. And for example, we had, we had a great conversation about how we're gonna engage the next generation of consumer. Why are we having that conversation exclusively at the executive team? So instead, a lot of those ideas were born from the panel of season, you know, the 21 season interns, because they were the closest audience to mapping out what is true and authentic engagement look like. And I think that that, I mean, when we talk about diversity, it's not about racial, gender, it is a, it, it's a 360, how do you bring dimensionality mm -hmm. to your business? I mean, when speaking about like looking internal and, you know, really looking at your organizations, uh, how do you guys show up for your teams and how do you create these, you know, psychologically safe spaces for them to, to be comfortable with, you know, contributing, to, to be comfortable with, you know, showing up as their full selves so that we're able to produce work that, you know, is reflective of the communities and markets that we're trying to reach? Transparency. For me, it's transparency. So anytime I've worked with anyone, and if anybody's in the room, I see some people, um, they will have heard me say this. I am transparent to a fault. You will know exactly what you get with me. And what I found is by being transparent, my teams trust me. Through that trust, they will run through a brick wall. Not for the organization, but because of the trust that we've built in each other. Mm -hmm. And so if I can be as transparent as possible with my team, that's everything, right? So when George Floyd was happening and people were calling me like, what do black people think? What, right, can you, can you talk about this? Can you be, and I was like, not now. Cause I'm dealing with some real stuff. Mm -hmm. I have a 17 year old son, a 14 year old son and a nine year old daughter, mm -hmm. right? Like, and so I had to be able to be really transparent and say like, this is where I am. Mm -hmm. I need a minute, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not in a place that I can do that. And then eventually I was like, now I can tell you. And when I did, and some of the people are in the room, right? Like I had a full breakdown mm -hmm. over Zoom with our entire LA 28 OCOG mm -hmm. because that's where I was. But because I was that transparent, I was able to, one, create relationships and connections that I didn't have before that with people who said, you know what? I had no idea, but now I have a different connection with you. 
And that created a different type of working relationship, mm -hmm. right? So it's, because I always go back to it's, it's a for-profit organization, right? Like, we, like we're trying to generate and make money. So there's no mistake about that. So in that, we had better relationships, and because of those better relationships, that, were, that created openness and dialogue and all of the things that you want to happen from a team. Can I riff from Nicole? Yes. Please. Please. Um, because I do think it comes down to understanding people, their authentic selves. Like, if you can understand and develop those relationships well before you need to exploit them. Um, Say that again. <laughs> it, it, it is how we all fight for each other and with each other. And I do think that for me, that is where psychological safety is built, right? You understand how people think, you understand where the sensitivities are, you understand that you don't think the same way and you appreciate them for that. And if you can develop that across the tone and tenor of your team, mm. you can get people, you can galvanize people in a way that is both personal and situational. And I think that that's really, really important. And for me, I don't see myself as a leader. I, I, it took coming to football for me to understand what leadership meant for me, which is coach people to, towards a singular end game, right? Give them something to fight for. Let them fight in a way that's authentically theirs. Um, and so that means that the greatest ideas can show up in small ways, in big ways. But that's them living their authentic selves. And I'm here to help shepherd and make sure that we are all marching in the same direction. In addition to that transparency, um, it's being super deliberate about creating conversations, mm -hmm. creating a space for conversations internally, externally. Um, at our organization, you know, post George Floyd, we had a ton of internal conversations um, just to get to know each other on a different plane and then outwardly facing, tapping into, uh, you know, being a community organization, servicing that community through, um, you know, different information sessions geared toward COVID-19 vaccinations, for example, or um, understanding the difficulties that people of color, businesses of color have, you know, securing loans or funding for their businesses and, and so on and so forth. Advocating for, um, you know, different legislation that would drastically alter the, the life chances of, of the youth in Massachusetts. So it's, it's creating internal, external conversations. You get to know, each other, get to know one another better and, and taking action on, the, and on those, the feedback that you get. Um, I'm not happy that you broke down, but I'm glad that you did in front of them mm -hmm. and showed them your whole self. Mm -hmm. I don't know that for, I don't know that there's a way not to like bring our whole selves into these kind of mm -hmm. rooms. And I, frankly, I don't think that we shouldn't. We absolutely should. <laughs> and like, Honestly, for me, this transparency, you're exactly right. But honestly, like, I just care. Like, we work with some amazing people. It's like hard not to care about them. We work closely together and we become family. And it's not that hard to just like give a shit about somebody. <laughs> and, and like, um, and so then that fosters like safety and transparency and all the other things. But it just starts with like care about the person next to you. They're your teammate. They're, you, you know, we're in this together. Um, and then speaking of transparency and full transparency, I've been very conflicted about being out front on some of these issues. I've been, I'm conflicted about being, frankly, on this stage right now, um, mostly because um, I've been in this business for over 15 years and the, you talk about keeping the ball rolling. It's, this is the particular ball that I would actually stop, like to stop rolling, mm -hmm. at least in this way. Um, because it, there's a sad irony to the first time I've been invited to speak at Sloan be about this topic, but not something that I have a professional experience and background in. <laughs> Thank you. So, Says um, someone who's 40 under 40 in his Amen. Yeah, space. and listen, as I, I understand that that's how sometimes that's, that's how it works, but like I, um, Diversity would be not us sitting up here on this panel. Diversity would just have us on the other panels where we actually have a background or professional experience in. Mm -hmm. And it's not that hard to add another chair and let us just sit up here and talk about what we do every day. The brands 
that we represent, the work that we do. Um, and so I just, I guess, want to be fully transparent with everybody to say, like, actually, I'm, the only thing I can share up here today is my personal experience. I'm not a professional in this space. I didn't study African-American history. I don't work in public policy. I, do, I don't do social justice. There are people, good people, amazing people who do that work. It is a trade. It is a skill. I'm a marketer. And so, like, I'm not going to sit here and fake. Like, I can um, share beyond my personal experience. So, I mean, so there's that, and that's fine, and I'm happy to do that. But I also want to be, like, honest with myself, our fellow panelists, yeah. mm -hmm. who are my people now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And with all of you guys, like that, that to me is kind of the sad irony and a bit of a microcosm of like what we're trying to achieve. And again, it's not that hard. Just hire the person, add another seat, mm -hmm. like, and just let us talk about the things that we do. And it, by the way, it just happens to be from a diverse perspective. That is diversity. Um, so again, I one want to be fully transparent, but also like let's not get lost in the complexity of something that actually it's not that hard to address in a lot of different ways. It is hard to navigate. I got a question for you. Okay. So you say pull up another seat. There's this conversation around hiring more women and mm -hmm. as coaches or hiring, um, you know, black coaches in different spaces. Like, mm -hmm. how do you get more comfortable if I'm trying to hire? Like, you said, how do I just pull up a seat? Because I, I I understand how easy that is. You understand how easy that is. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the difficulty in understanding that? I, honestly, I don't know. And he, here's why. I, I think one of the underrated answers that anyone can give is, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not a professional at this. But there are people who do know and can help all of yeah. us, all of us navigate mm -hmm. those kind of things. Um, so. For I my personal, say, though, mm -hmm. like to the, to your question, it's not to put you on the hot seat. It's no, just no, to throw that out there, like oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to to be honest, right? One is we're creatures of habit. We go with what we know. Mm -hmm. So if you've gotten ten people from that sports business management school who have been rock stars for you, you're gonna keep getting people from that sports business man. I'm seeing the heads, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I did not go to sports management school. Mm. Yep. <laughs> right? And if somebody was just looking through that lens, I would have never made it to the New York Knicks. I would have never made it to the USTA. I would have never made it to Legends. I would have never made it to LA 28. Right? So if it's, if it's you're a creature of comfort and habit and you just go with what you know, right? It's like there used to be the saying like, oh, it's the boys club. Like you pull from your your alma mater, your alum, your, right? And you know that you're gonna get people who, and it's not to knock any of it. There are amazing programs and they're amazing students. But if you just stay in that space of comfort, mm -hmm. then that is what you will continue to get. And when you look back and you go, yeah, everybody looks the same. Everything is, but everything's going well, right? But how much better could it be? Mm -hmm. yeah. How much more innovative could you be? And that's the part where you have to get uncomfortable. Like, I've learned that in my own career. Like, any time that I've gotten into a space that I have been uncomfortable is when things go to the next level. Mm -hmm. As scary and as fearful as I have been in that space. But that is what has to happen as an industry. I think we have to do a better job of just challenging, like, the status quo in a lot of our working environments. We do get comfortable. And I think we kind of continue to kind of just go with the flow of how things have been doing. And when you have new people come into the room and they are challenging that, sometimes they're excluded. Sometimes they're pushed out because they're not adopting that way of thinking. That's, it's so important to us to have leaders like yourselves in these spaces to kind of bring people in. So you're actually making that decision and you can pull up that chair for that next person. And I think that is our responsibility in, in the roles and positions that we currently have. And I, and I think, you know, one of the great signs of leadership is followership. Mm. But you also, part of the reason that that is so important is because of those relationships that underlie that followership. Those people are most willing to challenge you, right? And, and that's why I found the advocates throughout my life have presented opportunities I didn't think about have presented opportunities where I was like, no, too big. And they go, 
doesn't matter. Yeah. Going for it anyway. Sucks to be you. Mm -hmm. Figure it out. And, and for me, it's being, to your very point, it's being uncomfortable and pushing through, mm -hmm. whether it's ambiguity, nobody looks like me, we're gonna figure it out. And I think that having that sense of trust, whether it's with your peers, with, you know, with your mentors and advocates, but just understanding that there aren't those barriers and that many of them are created within your own mind. Mm -hmm. And the minute that you start to feel it, you recognize it, you get very, you start to crave, how do I pay this forward? Mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I expand the way I feel by casting a wider net and ensuring that that becomes my followership? Yeah. Also, you gotta own your stuff and just try to do better. So like in the <laughs> interest of transparency, like I grew up playing basketball for only male coaches mm -hmm. and probably as early, like recently as five or six years ago, if you say VP of player development, I would have thought for an NBA team, I would have thought, oh, that, that's a guy. But like, no, like it would have been dope for you to help me develop yeah, as a facts. player. Facts. But that, um, but like that was a blind spot in my, as a man in this yeah. industry, um, because there's, I guess there's also diversity and privilege. Mm -hmm. And so um, understanding that, oh no, these jobs aren't just for these people, or there's no zero sum game or limit to the number of people you can have on a team or have on the stage yeah. and be in a room. Like all of this is made up. There's no reason only four panelists. We can have five or six, that could change tomorrow. So like, it's a little bit like owning some of the areas where you have an opportunity to learn or someone shares or shows or teaches you something, just like, okay, own it and try to do better. And then I think it like, you naturally start to pay it forward mm -hmm. and pass it on and that kind of thing. So um, yeah. without taking offense or being defensive about those kind of things, yeah, I, I mean, five years ago, that was my thinking. I'm trying to I'm see that what the world actually is and I'm trying to do better in it today and just kind of live and work and navigate the space in that way. So like I would ask, like honestly, we're talking about, when I say this particular ball, I mean thinking about these kind of panels where you have four marketers of color talking about diversity. Mm -hmm. It's like we've all been to the panels and the conferences where they have this panel. Mm -hmm. And we gotta stop doing it this way. Either just put us on the other panels where we actually have professional expertise or how about we do it differently? Bring in people from um, the industries that work in this space to come help us, guide us, and how to navigate these things through. The, the, the analogy that I think about is, it would be like the ACLU having a conference, and at that conference they have a panel to talk about basketball analytics. And in, instead of inviting anybody from this conference, they just did it themselves. <laughs> I'm sure they had a lovely conversation, but that ain't progress. <laughs> And so like, if we're gonna do this and like, actually like, be committed to real true progress, think about it differently and care a little bit, own our stuff. Yeah, we've done this panel over and over again, but like, let's actually do it differently next time or not do it at all. I'd be fine with that. Um, because otherwise we're just spinning and we're just talking mm -hmm. and we're not really evolving. Mm -hmm. We're just patting ourselves on the back and then we'll go have a drink afterwards. And like, that's, like, that's we accomplished not much of anything. So. Um, and not just slowing all of these conferences that we yeah. do, like, let's actually do it differently. Mm -hmm. And just invite us to come speak on the panels to talk about the brands that we work on and the teams that we work for yeah. and the things that we actually have a professional expertise or background in. Not that hard, at least not to me. I, I understand, like yeah. sometimes like, I, like it's am not. I crazy? No, no. I mean, you well, are, I might be, but not actually, in that, but. Not, <laughs> not, not, not for that reason. <laughs> I mean, I've known you for a long time, yes you are. But yes, I am, that. okay. But if I could just say one other thing about this is when you're hiring, because I have been in this situation, and someone says, okay, we're gonna bring on somebody, and that person ends up being a diverse candidate, and maybe that person does not hit the mark. Mm. Do not make that the one diverse candidate that you bring in, and now you're like, well, I told you it wasn't gonna work, we're gonna go back to this sports management program, or we're gonna mm -hmm. go over here, because yeah. that is not okay, right? Like, we cannot just sort of say, okay, we're going to have a token hire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and that person now is has the weight of the world on their shoulders to deliver or to show up or to do and you have not and i see you had like head nods and you have not given that person the chance or this is their first opportunity in this space or they just have not had the same experiences and exposure because let's be serious like you go to college and you learn what you learn and then you forget everything you learn and then you go into the real world and that is where you learn through yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. And unless you've had the opportunity to have experience, what? What are we expecting? Yeah. And so there's got to be some room to allow this to happen, to allow there to be growth, to allow there to be mistakes, right? It's okay to fail fast and innovate, right? We say that. That's okay with people too. Mm -hmm. Like we need to be able to give room for that. Now I'm not saying you need to hang your hat and let everybody just come in like, oh, they're not productive. They're not working, right? That's not what I'm saying. But I have seen and been in situations where you give it a shot over here and then everybody looks and is like, well, that didn't work out. So let's go back to what we know. And that is not how we're going to change. I mean, to keep it a buck, like I'm actually, hold on, I'm sorry. I got too comfortable. Um, <laughs> I knew what you meant. Hey, but that's, but that's the whole Keep going. Yes, no, yeah. keep going. That's the language. Just, Say that. Just that's talking the, that's about the language. that, you know, that same topic. Yeah, um, you know, a, a mentor of mine, he was saying, you know, within your first week, you're able to determine, you know, what the trajectory is going to be for you at whatever that new employer is. And that was so true for me um, at the MBA. And I think there was, you know, this expectation, you know, coming into that role that I was going to know how to do everything. But coming in that first week, you know, it's really important to kind of outline expectations. It's really important to communicate, even down to the things of like, what moves you? What motivates you? Mm -hmm. how, do you how, how do you best communicate? because we all come from different social economic backgrounds, you know, racial backgrounds, and even tone in those things can be taken differently depending on the new spaces that you're coming into. And, and that investment in your talent from the get-go is so important. Having that, that entry interview, so to speak, can really determine if someone's gonna succeed or not, you know, at the rest of their time within the business. And I feel so often you know, we do, you know, your typical onboarding process right at the beginning, but no one ever follows up. There's no follow-up, no follow-through, no check-ins to make sure that we're grooming, investing this talent who's never had this opportunity or chance before ever in their lifetime, and we're expecting them to figure it out. And then when they fail, they're like, oh, well, told you so. Told you that wasn't going to work out. But what investment did you put in that talent? But what I think is so meaningful and the ones that I've seen work really, really well is it's a conversation about values. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation about what's important, not in terms of this project gets done at this time or you know that people think this way, but what are the things that unite all of us, mm -hmm. that transcend beyond what you look like, the experiences mm -hmm. you've had, what your background is. These are the things that bring us together, that galvanize us. And it's the values, whether it's you know, we are going to, in our case, we're gonna leave LA a better place than we found it. Mm -hmm. Wholeheartedly, yes, we are in the, you know, in the, in the sport of this business, but that is one piece of the larger puzzle. And if you can get people to understand why we do these things and who they, how they underscore who we are as a brand, and you are subscribing to be part of that mission, I found it to unlock a lot more because you're not having a conversation about why is your experience different than mine? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's about how can I bring the richness of that experience to make the next move we make better? Like we were in the in the restroom, and we were talking about moms, right? And I was like, yeah, my mom would kill me like if I went out there and my ankles were ashy. Ooh, <laughs> and then Kat was like, yeah, well, my mom would be like, breathe in and don't have like your stomach show, right? Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> probably more than you all wanted to know. But the conversation of us connecting, right, on that level had nothing to do with Kat's background or my, it's mm -hmm. like your personal life experience. Mm -hmm. And now like, I mean, we're joking around with you guys, but like between the call that we had to 
start this conversation to us being like giggling backstage and not realizing we had to come out here. Um, <laughs> this is now a group, like this is our cr a crew, right? Like this will be, there will be, and I will promise you there will be business that will happen because of this. There will be relationships mm -hmm. that will continue to build and grow, but it was because we were able to like break down and have like a conversation about something other than. Just being people. We just people. I kind of I kind of challenge that you guys us we aren't experts in this because above and beyond what a title could say what a, what training like you drop gems that are the living breathing essence of what diversity equity inclusion is mm -hmm. so but do like, you think they are about diversity, equity, and inclusion? No, or they're about no, being no, it's good about being people. Yeah. Just life. Leadership, leadership, good people. Right? And that's where I, I challenge the same way yes. Broderick mm -hmm. does, is this is who I am. This is how I show up. These are the values I bring with me. So this does is really this a leadership sense? panel. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you all know yeah. that. Well, listen, I, I am welcome to be challenged on that. I guess I don't feel like I don't identify as an expert yeah, in this sure. space, but I'm open to being challenged on that mm -hmm. um, and having a conversation about it or whatever it is that, you know, we follow up on. Right. So like um, a good I, leader would never say I'm a good leader. Right. <laughs> but exactly. so that's why this I'm really crowning you a boss <laughs> yeah, okay. right here. In D &I. She said we were <laughs> leaders. And so therefore, this is now a leader conversation. OK. <laughs> But like I'm, I'm more than open to it. I guess I just want to acknowledge that there are that this is also when it comes to diversity, this is a professional trade as well. Yes. And there are people who are on the front lines Facts. in the streets, Ferguson, Chicago, Baltimore, that are doing amazing work. That are coming. They, that that have uh, a wealth of knowledge and guidance, and they can come into our boardrooms and to our companies to help guide us in a space that frankly, um, we have blind spots yes. as an industry. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, our agency asks our clients to trust us because we are experts in sports and entertainment and culture, we should take our own advice mm -hmm. yeah. and bring those experts to help guide us in this area. We can't do it ourselves. We literally can't, do, and we shouldn't. It's, again, it's diversity of thought. They have a completely different perspective based on the work that they do. It's hard, it's complex, it's sensitive. Yeah. And mm -hmm. even the level of expertise that they have, the progress is, is mm -hmm. infinitesimal mm -hmm. and it's long and it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why we as marketers think we could do it ourselves. Like, why would we think that? Right. So I just, it's like, let's acknowledge Mm -hmm. You know, whether we're an expert or not, let's acknowledge yeah. like this is where my professional expertise is, but this is also a trade. And mm -hmm. this is why if we bring this all together, maybe we can like um, advance this what's more than a movement, but advance what diversity actually looks like, feels like or is yeah. um, more and better and faster than we could on our own. I will say that um, the oppressor cannot be the problem solver. They can't continue to be the problem solver. And what I mean by that, uh, at my time at the NBA, um, I led a lot of work on our direct-to-consumer content strategy business. And you know, when George Floyd was murdered, uh, we were kind of banding together and we were like, let's put together this task force. And of course, what they did is, you know, and this is no knock, I love the NBA, but um, they just recruited all of the black employees and said, okay, you guys fix this. You guys come together. Uh, what should we do internally? What should we do externally? And you know, there was a lot of conversation of like, why aren't we bringing experts into the room to have these conversations and to, to help us to sort out these solutions? And I feel also often, you know, um, in a lot of companies and especially across sports, you know, we have our handful of, of black leaders across our organizations and we're pulling them in, expecting them to solve the problem. And, and that can't continue to happen. Um, I think, you know, yes, we can, we can contribute, we can share our personal stories and our personal experiences in that and provide that feedback, but it's, it's also on our peers. It's also on our white counterparts to do the work. I'm, I'm sure it'll be much more well received if, if it was coming from our white leaders and things that we could do to, to improve in, in this area. It's, it's definitely a group effort, but I, I did want to just share that because I, I feel like that's a, a constant narrative 
you know, that we hear. And to build off of that, I mean, it, it took, um, so some of you may have heard Amy House speak earlier, and she has been one of the most instrumental change agents in my life. And that's because I wore my imposter syndrome as a protective shield. I did. And she was like, that is one of the most useless things I have ever seen. <laughs> like, just live up to your badass self. And, and if you fail, you fail. But like, don't be afraid to put yourself out there the way that I wouldn't be afraid to put myself out there. What's the difference between you and I? Mm -hmm. yeah. And to have someone knowing that I didn't have a lot of role models in my professional career that looked like me, that gave me the playbook to follow, it's people like that seeing it in you when you don't see it in yourself. And so that's, as I said earlier, that's the infectious quality of like, ooh, no. Where do I get to sprinkle this around yes. next? How do I get to deputize the next generation of talent with, you know, and I look at Margaret oh, in the back there, of just like, how do you bottle that badass and, and, and really give them the wings to fly? Because they haven't seen it and they haven't heard it and they have sat there. And, and for me, in telling my personal story, I struggled, right? Mm -hmm. I believed. You know, and, and some of this is cultural from my background. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, be seen and not heard. Be, be you know, be diminutive when when the situation calls for it. And it was like throw all that shit to the wind, and and show up because that's the most important thing you can do. And we are to your point, worse off when you don't do it. Mm. It's so true. Man, imposter syndrome can be an entire panel. That could be mm. a whole that is a whole conversation. And in transparency, I feel like an imposter talking about diversity. <laughs> That's why I'm <laughs> Roderick is not gonna let us forget. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're not talking about right. it. But I even I'm gonna transition really quickly and we got some questions um, from Twitter, so I do wanna make sure that we address those. But I do want us also to question imposter syndrome. It shouldn't be something that we're feeling like, why are we feeling it? It's very systemic, you know, it's, it has to do with the organizations and the things that they're perpetuating on their front. You know, I think a lot of what we even talked about here too is like responsibilities as leaders, you know, I think that's even talking about microaggressions and, you know, like that implicit bias and those sorts of things. So there's so much to be said on imposter syndrome. So I think for anyone who is experiencing that, you know, like don't question yourself, question the institution. Um, but all right, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna share Couple questions that we got from Twitter. <laughs> Little Russian roulette moment and see. Let's see. Okay. Well, actually, no, we got one for Allison. Uh, you played in Pro League that is 80% black women. What did you learn about working in a diverse team in the WNBA that you've taken to the business world? What did you learn about mentorship? Hmm. The WNBA. Uh, is a remarkable place because of the player, I guess, the player body. A lot of the women are super accomplished um, on and off the court. Many of them uh, have their four year degrees, have advanced degrees, have experience playing, you know, in Europe. Um, that helped me, that has helped me tremendously in my work now. I've played a number of different roles, have, you know, had to go abroad to play ball, had to, you know, be in adverse um, environments where there was adversity was, you know, steep in adversity. Anyway, it's helped me tremendously. Um, it's helped me also want to pay, pay it forward, give back, um, and, uh, you know, invest in, in, in my colleagues around me. So um, it's really prepared me for what I'm doing now. Awesome. Hopefully that answers the question. And the, the next question is for everyone. When interviewing with a company or potential client, how do you scout the culture and ultimately ultimately decide to join or pass? Yeah. Uh, I can kick that off. Um, uh, I left, so I was the CMO of Live Nation prior to coming to the Rams. Um, and I left in February of last year. And I took for myself, for my family, um, and for the team that I was going to join, I took a lot of time. Um, and for me, it was the scouting of people. 
-hmm. and values. Uh, I spent over five months making the decision that I did because I wanted to know what did success need to look like? Who was I going to work for? Who was I going to work with? How, how much of myself can I bring to the job? Um, and I do think that for me, this was one of the first times in my entire career I had the luxury of time. And because of that, because I knew the values, I knew who I'd work for, uh, shout out to Kevin Demoff, who is one of the best people on the globe. Um, I knew what I was getting into, and I felt really confident I could show up as myself, uh, and I could lead as myself. And I haven't not had it. It's been a crazy seven months with the Los Angeles Rams, <laughs> Super Bowl champs. Um, <laughs> But I have loved every single minute of it. And I have had zero reservations through that journey because of what I had that upfront luxury to enjoy, which is I knew who I was. I knew who they were. I knew who we would be. Um, and that journey has allowed me to live every sort of iota of that that's authentically. The that's the key is like, one, like know exactly what it is that you want that environment to be and look like. Like what do you want out of that environment? And have a real clear understanding. I mean, when I made my shift from LA28 to Underdog Venture Team, it was, I had four filters and I knew exactly what those four filters were and what I wanted in this next chapter. But I had to take like self-reflective time to just sit and be like, okay, I need to really be in a space and understand what it is I want this chapter to look like. And once I knew, it made it really easy to say yes and no to things. Because as different opportunities would come through and different people would bring up things, I was like, mm, no, mm -hmm. right? And, and you've got to like hold to your convictions to say like, I, want, I wanted all four things. And I felt like I was in a place where I was like, I'm not, I'm not settling for three. I'm not settling for two. No, I want all four. And then do your due diligence. A company, you're not just interviewing for that company. That, you need to be interviewing that company. Mm -hmm. You need to be interviewing your boss. You need to be interviewing, right? Like, you should put yourself in that position because you want to be able to know that you know that you know that this is the place for you. So... I interview, and then I ask around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do your homework. Do your homework, because they're asking around about you. So I ask around. I look to see what they're posting on LinkedIn. I look to see, right? I want to know. And I can tell you, like, my co-founders, Dan Mannix, David Nugent, like, I've known them in the industry for a long time, and they are who they say they are. And when you ask people about them, regardless of what, when and who you're talking to, they're all saying similar things, right? So that's what you want. You wanna make sure that you're getting that same kind of feedback and doing your due diligence. I don't have an answer to that one. I've been in Wasserman 15 years, so <laughs> I, it's, I mean, I haven't interviewed in a while. So I'm listening to you on that one. Well, Broderick, we actually have a question for you. Okay. Uh, how do you think about the role of culture, especially around DEI, when you are working with an advertising brand in your role at Wasserman? Um, on some level, we didn't, because there's still, I mean, this is still a job, and our first, um, at least, order of business is to make sure we are doing the right work and providing the right information in a strategic direction to our clients. Um, and then from a, I guess, just a strategic marketing standpoint, you could be advertising whatever channel. I, it all, we, we always came back to does the team, does the crew, does the front of camera um, cast reflect the market that you are trying mm -hmm. to reach? Mm -hmm. um, we don't, and I think the narrative even got skewed a little bit because we were in a place where like, we got to get younger, we got to get more diverse. And it wasn't getting younger and more diverse for its own sake. Mm -hmm. It was to, again, reshift and, and reproportionalize um, our makeup 
so then we can all come together and provide the best information, strategic direction, and creative um, to put that brand forward to as many consumers. I mean, again, we're marketers first, and all we're saying is like a diverse team will help you get to a better answers or better work to then help the brand. So, like, I mean, there's like it's kind of like this like pretty straight line of it should be a win for everybody. Um, so it really just came down to like making sure like we reflected the market. Well, I think we're about to close. So I did want to just, uh, you know, restate as we said in the beginning and as Broderick made sure we will not forget, we are not experts in this space. <laughs> yeah. uh, we are all marketing folks and, you know, we all know that there's more work that needs to be done, um, you know, to encourage diversity on all fields and on all fronts. Uh, but I did want us to be able to walk away with with some resources and some some thoughts and references, you know, that this group of folks can can provide you all with. Um, so hoping that we can kind of go down the line and you guys share with these guys, you know, um, some resources that they could tap into and look into further. So because we aren't talking about diversity, I'm going to give my takeaway as a leadership takeaway, which is I think that um, great authenticity comes from great vulnerability. And so my, my resource for all of you, and it's multi, you know, multi-platforms, so if you wanna read or if you, you prefer Netflix, um, Brene Brown is my recommendation because when you can tap into the roots of shame and vulnerability, you can be a better person. I love, I love, 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 love. Mm -hmm. um, there's a group uh, called the Kavu Group, C-A-V-U Group, <coughs> um, out of New York, Leslie Short, is the person who has that up. She's a DEI strategist. She is an expert. This is what she does and has done for a number of years. There's multiple out there, but she is one who is really pushing and innovative in the space and works with Fortune 500 companies. So that's somebody that I go to personally, but also she has a great service. Um, and then just reading and being aware of mm -hmm. other things happening on and it could be here, it could be in our industry, but it could be outside of that or just in the world to be sensitive to it. And I'm looking out here and I'm trying to see if you guys are writing these down, so I hope you are. <laughs> okay. I have no resources greater than those, but I do wanna take the time to wish my colleagues at the Celtics national um, happy um, Women's History Month. Yes, um, we just promoted our yeah. first SVP, uh, woman SVP, Nicole Federico. I want to shout her out. I want to shout out all the other colleagues. That we have a couple of VPs in, in um, our PR department, and we have a host of other uh, you know, employees who are celebrating this month. So that's all I got for you. Um, yeah, I, honestly, I don't have a ton of resources other than like the people around us. I go to like my, I feel most comfortable going to the people that I'm closest to. Uh, including like Lindsay LeBennett, who runs our DEI program at Wasserman. She's beyond passionate about this um, and the work that she's doing to help um, our company make progress. I, I just and and she's made more than a few um, uh, inroads and built relationships across you know the diversity space. And so that plus friends plus now my people up here, mm -hmm. I will be coming to you. And honestly, I'd like to thank Sloan for, I mean, it's been 15 years coming, but like I, I appreciate they invited me to the last <laughs> DEI panel that we are going to have at this conference. So I feel pretty awesome about that. Thank you, Roger. Um, and I was going to just share two articles that I love referencing and, and speaking about, and we didn't get to talk about it here, but uh, check out um, these two articles. One's called From Pet to Threat, and uh, there's another one. Um, titled Stop Telling Women That They Have Imposter Syndrome. Yeah, that's what it's titled. All right, guys, well, that sums up our discussion. I just want to thank you for taking the time to choosing to be here at this panel and, and listening to this conversation. Uh, once again, just want to thank our panelists, Roderick, Allison, Nicole, and Kat, for joining us today. Again, I'm Candace Altman. Again, happy Women's History Month. Yes.